from KLCC Studios, this is Oregon on the Record. I'm Michael Dunn. In such a divided nation that we live in, there's something pretty universal that binds us. We all love the idea of a tax refund. Getting money back from the tax man is great. And here in Oregon, we have a very unique program that acts like a special gift when overall revenue is greater than spending, our kicker. We're getting one again this year, as dictated by our state constitution. Today on Oregon on the Record, we're gonna talk about the kicker, or more specifically, you're gonna hear from two voices on polar opposite sides of the kicker. One group, the Cascade Policy Institute, loves it and believes it must stay. While another group, the Oregon Center for Public Policy, says the kicker is inherently unfair and we should instead spend the money on important social programs. It's a kicker conversation today on Oregon on the Record. Today on Oregon on the Record, you'll hear experts on both sides of the kicker debate and how it should be treated. On one side, you have an organization, the Cascade Policy Institute, that says our legislators are horrible at spending our money and those kicker funds should come right back to us. While another group, the Oregon Center for Public Policy, says the kicker is a giveaway to the rich and a terrible way to manage money that should go to social services. First, you'll hear from the first group who basically says, hands off our kicker. John Charles, the president of the Cascade Policy Institute, thanks so much for coming on and talking with us. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Boy, just generally speaking, you know, talk about how your organization views Oregon's kicker. You know, why do you support it? Oregon's kicker is idiosyncratic. People have fun talking about it, but it's very popular. And uh, the reason I support it is because it is actually the only break on spending in Oregon. It's in the Constitution. It's very difficult to override by politicians. <clears throat> and you have to keep in mind, well, based on my 40 years of professional experience in the political arena, Oregon doesn't have an income problem. It has a spending problem. Hmm. And politicians at all levels love to spend other people's money, OPM, other people's money. That's <laughs> what they love. <laughs> and no matter how much you give them, they will always spend it plus more. So the kicker law, which has only really mattered in about uh, 13 years in the last 40 Okay. Uh, not very significantly in 10 of those years. I think it gives uh, Oregonians assurance that if there's a big spike in revenue far above what's projected, they're going to get a refund, and they love it. What would you say? There are voices that, especially when, 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 the, <clears throat> kick, when the kicker is announced, there are voices that say something along the lines of this. Wouldn't it be better if we took that money and we put it into services like uh, uh, services that or, or, or programs that help people struggling with homelessness or drug addiction? You know, what's your answer to those voices? Well, I just say to people, have you ever watched the legislature when they sit down to do budgets? Have you ever watched an appropriations committee meeting? Because I have. Mm -hmm. hundreds of times. And if you watch the small committees that control the spending, if you really watch what they do, it's appalling. It's like a bunch of sixth graders on a sugar high. <laughs> <clears throat> so the notion that the upcoming $5.6 billion kicker refund, that if we just gave it to politicians, they would thoughtfully and wisely spend it on things, that is a joke. You have to be completely naive to think that they would make good decisions. Here's an example. In the one of the Secretary of State's audits on Measure 110, legislatively, legislatively required audits, they said, hey, in the early rollout, 2021, Oregon Health Authority spent $33 million. And then when we came into audit later, <clears throat> we could not tell you we cannot tell you where the money went, what it went for, or did anything happen with it. Hmm. This, is, this is a program that was nationally prominent. Everybody in the country is watching Oregon roll out Measure 110. And for $33 million, 
here we are in 2024. No one even knows where it went. <laughs> mm. I mean, that is so typical. Why would you want to give these people more money? Let me remind folks, we're talking with John Charles. He's the president of the Cascade Policy Institute and talking about uh, talking about Oregon's kicker. Um, you know, there's also those voices who say something like this, that the kicker favors people in higher income brackets. They get more money back. You know, kind of what's your what's your position on that? It is true because they put more money in much, much more money. Oregon has a highly progressive income tax rate. It's 4.75 percent at the low end and 9.9 percent .9 at the high end unless you live in, in the Portland area, which you're subject to several other local taxes on high income people. Mm -hmm. So if the proposal is by some people, I'm familiar with this, to apportion the kicker just on a per person basis, then I'd say, fine, let's um, also have a flat tax, 4.75% for everybody. Hmm. So rich people <clears throat> would not be putting as much in, which would also have the benefit of reducing the volatility. You know, when you have a system that is overwhelmingly based on a small number of people earning a lot of money in years when that their income fluctuates wildly, then you have a lot of volatility in the system. So there's many good reasons for a flat tax, but one of them would be if people want to return kicker money on a per person basis, regardless of their income or tax status, then let's start first with a flat tax. Um, in addition to the controversy, the pro and cons of, of the kicker, there's also been some, I, I don't know if it's recent controversy, but certainly some recent articles written about how, how the the, the kicker is calculated and how the state economists might lowball figures to make sure the kicker is higher. Just wanted to get your opinion on, on, on how you think the kicker is calculated. It kind of jumps off on, on what you were just talking about a little bit about apportionment, but also just j j the general, how you calculate the, the, the whole pie. Well, I'm not going to impugn the integrity of the state economists okay. <clears throat> to say that they are deliberately lowballing. I think they have a really thankless job made worse by the fact that Oregon, again, idiosyncratically chooses a two year budget cycle, mm -hmm. which makes their job exponentially more difficult. Oregon could switch to an annual budget cycle, which would make the budgeting much more accurate. And I have no particular opinion about that, but it could be done. Okay. But <clears throat> I think they do the very best job they can with what they have. But there are, you know, no matter what you set up as a system, and these are all tax systems are arbitrary and can be gamed, I think it's already being gamed because the general fund is not that significant to Oregon. It's actually the only the third largest chunk of money. Hmm. Above it is federal, federal money coming in, and mm -hmm. the biggest chunk, about 42% of the budget, is what's called other funds. And those are more along the line of user fees, not taxes, fees for service, like what the DMV charges for a license or what the Fish and Wildlife Department charges for a fishing license. So <clears throat> agencies already have the capacity when they don't get enough, enough by their definition, tax money they can raise direct fees for service. And they have done that, and they continue to do it. So that budget item, other funds, is now the single largest segment of revenue, about 42%. Hmm. And I expect agencies will continue to do that. So there's a lot of workarounds, a lot of things you could tweak some of which would be fine, some of which I would oppose. Okay. But, uh, you know, you could, or you could also, <clears throat> the legislature could encourage the budget, uh, the forecast team, state economists, to be very aggressive, 
to assume higher levels of income, which the economist is loath to do because they don't want to put the, the uh, legislature in a position of not having enough money. If the legislature just said, look, no matter what number you pick, we will adopt a spending level 15% below it. Well, that would insulate the economist from that fear. Hmm. And I don't really see anything stopping the legislature from a self-imposed low revenue budget. And then if they're wrong, uh, they could tweak it in the interim. Again, I think that's a way to game the system, which as far as I know, they choose not to, but they probably could. John Charles, I really want to say thank you. John Charles, the president of the Cascade Policy Institute. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate the opportunity. And now you'll hear from another group who thinks we should do away with the kicker and spend that money on more social services. Daniel Hauser, Deputy Director for the Oregon Center for Public Policy. Thanks so much for coming on and, and talking with us. Thanks for having me on. Boy, let's just start kind of from the, the, the baseline. Talk about your, organiza your organization's position on the, the Oregon kicker. Well, the Oregon Center for Public Policy has spent decades now arguing that we should repeal the kicker, right? That the kicker is a broken and inequitable policy that should just be fully repealed, right? Hmm. We should remove it from the Constitution. Um, and really, we're open to any reform that gets us to a better place. Uh, I say that because the voters have made it pretty clear in, in polls that have been made public over the recent years that repealing the kicker entirely, not, not some kind of transitional policy or some improvements to the kicker, but repealing it entirely is not the most uh, appealing option okay. to Oregonians. Um, but fundamentally, the kicker, it's an impossible task for the state economist. Right. I mean, the kicker is is it's just completely broken. Hmm. The state economist's office, they have to forecast the global, national and state economies two years in advance. Right. They need to figure out how many Oregonians will sell their homes, cash and in investments, have an estate to tax, yeah. get raises or pay cuts and on and on. And if they miss by just two percent, the whole miss, the whole amount over the forecast gets kicked out. And so that's why the kicker, it, it's broken and inequitable, and it should be removed from the Constitution. But not only that, but the kicker, it disproportionately flows to the very richest households, right? The richest one in five Oregonians, the top 20%, get two-thirds of the kicker. The top 1% will get an average of $45,000 this year. Meanwhile, the poorest one in five Oregonians, folks earning less than $12,000 per year, will get an average of $60, right? Mm. We're talking about a policy that provides pennies to the poor, tens or even hundreds of thousands to the very rich. Um, so it's it's really a policy that should just be eradicated. Um, but recognizing that the public, um, you know, that many people like getting their kicker. I like getting my kicker, right? Mm -hmm. So repealing the kicker is not really a, a, a political solution today, even if it's the best policy. Okay. And so we'd be very open to to other means of reforming the kicker. What might that look like? Short of repeal, as you just said, that 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 that's very hard to do. What do you think, just generally speaking, some of those possible reforms could take the shape of? Well, there are millions of better options than our current kicker, right? Mm -hmm. The current policy is so bad that it's not hard to imagine something better. Um, let me give you a few examples, okay. right? We could, we could invest the kicker in our communities directly, right? We could build more affordable housing. We could build more facilities that children could receive high-quality care in. Uh, we could build more long-term care facilities, right, to to help you know house in a safe and and quality manner our growing older population of older Oregonians. Uh, we could invest in paying teachers in in our water and sewage facilities so things don't explode when they freeze. Um, <laughs> there's just a an absolute litany of ways that we could invest the billions of dollars that flow out of the state because of uh, because of the because of the kicker. I mean, the kicker that's going out this year is $5.6 billion. For our, our listeners, let me uh, reintroduce our guest, Daniel Hauser. He's the deputy director for the Oregon Center for Public Policy, and we're talking about Oregon's kicker. Um, are there other potential uh, pieces of legislation to modify the kicker to get to those pathways you just described, or those, I should say, uh, amendments or, or adjustments? Because the kicker is in the Constitution, 
our options are limited. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a great example of why uh, we shouldn't put tax policies in the Constitution, hmm. is that if we wanted to make modest tweaks to the kicker, you know, right now the kicker threshold is at 2%, right? If the state economist misses their guess two years out by 3%, then the entire amount's uh, heading back to, to tax filers. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to amend that to 8% or something, right, um, to make it to where it had to be a pretty big miss, something like that would require a constitutional change, not a statutory change, right? You can't just pass a law in the legislature. Okay. So the legislature, all they can do, they really have two options largely. One is to get a big enough majority, a two-thirds majority of both chambers to suspend the kicker. And that basically means that like just this kicker is not going to go out to taxpayers. Instead, we're going to do something else with it, right? And last year, they weren't able to to attract that much support. Yeah. Another option is to refer it to uh, refer directly a constitutional amendment to the voters. And there are certainly varying ideas uh, around, are there other small statutory changes that can be made to the state's budgeting process? Uh, or to the way we define general fund revenues, you know, somewhat more technical options that aren't uh, prohibited by the Constitution. Um, but I'm, I'm, I haven't seen any uh, good legal analysis that sure. those are options we can move forward with today. Sure, sure. I imagine you get this question a lot, but it's, 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 it's incumbent upon me to ask, what do you say to folks who say, you know, just like you described, the, the kicker's in the Constitution. I want my tax money coming back to me. You know, what do you say to that other argument about why the kicker is a good thing? I'm sure, I'm sure that voters more than two decades ago did not know exactly how the kicker was, was distributed. And they also weren't living in a world of such severe income and economic inequality. Mm -hmm. So I think when it was put in the Constitution, I don't think the voters realized we would end up at quite the um, the failure, the, the inequitable policy we ended up with today. I mean, we estimated based on Department of Revenue data that the richest 100 Oregonians will average a kicker worth more than $800,000 when they file in the next few months. Let me draw the other side of this okay. is Oregonians that are surviving on Social Security alone, right? Struggling to stay housed, fed, and, and to, to make it through. They don't get a kicker at all. Right. Folks receiving just Social Security income don't get a penny from the kicker. And so I think that when the kicker policy was put in the Constitution, I don't think folks realized just how bad it was, just how broken it was and inequitable mm -hmm. it was. And I think Oregonians deserve an opportunity to reassess that and to decide if there's a better path forward for the kicker. Yeah, yeah. Here's kind of a philosophical question just about the, the idea of taxation and, and this idea of, you know, are people – individuals better at saying where their money should go or is or organizations better and I know that that's a that's almost a, an impossible choice but I, I I'm asking because you know is there a better way that we as a state can address so much of what you just talked about while still you know, <laughs> People don't want to pay taxes. I think that's that's pretty universal. Or they want to pay lower taxes. You know, is there this middle path that uh, that we could possibly work towards, uh, in your estimation? I hope so. I mean, I think fundamentally, it's something we see again and again that there's an underappreciation that taxes pay for the common good, right? Yeah. They pay for our education, our roads, our safety. You know, uh, so many of the seniors and, and low income families in our communities are receiving support through our tax dollars, right? Our shared investment in the public and the common good. Taxes are absolutely how we collectively solve problems. Mm -hmm. right? But um, I want to, to, I need more money. Right? Like, <laughs> I'm broke, I'm struggling. Sure. You know, it's, it's hard for our families to, you know, uh, all the way up the income spectrum up to, you know, middle class families really struggle deeply to afford their bills, right? Yeah. Um, Housing is extremely expensive. And so people want to keep as much money as they as they can, uh, as they earn. And we have to find the right balance, right? Right now, the balance in Oregon, it's upside down, right? The lowest income families pay the highest share of their income in taxes than, than anyone, right? 
the very highest earning families pay a lower share of their income in taxes than um, than a, a huge swath of other Oregonians, right? So we have an upside down tax system that worsens inequality. Sure. And so when we think about how we fund public services, right, basic needs that our communities and our and our society needs, we should be leaning on those who have the most. We shouldn't be leaning on those, you know, low income working families that are barely struggling to get by. And our income tax here in Oregon, our income tax is progressive, right? Our income tax alone does lean more heavily on higher income Oregonians than lower income Oregonians. Hmm. But our collective state and local tax system does not, right? That's what I was referring to having, you know, the bottom paying the most. Sure. And what we can do is right now the kicker it undermines our personal income tax. It takes one of our most progressive taxes, the personal income tax, and it cuts it down heavily. I mean, this most recent kicker, I think it's more than 40% of the personal income tax revenues will be returned out to taxpayers. So really when we talk about taxes and government, we need these services, we need these investments. In fact, we need more of these investments, but we have to raise that revenue from the richest Oregonians, not those who are struggling most to survive. And the kicker really worsens that inequity. Got it, got it. Well, Daniel Hauser, Deputy Director for Oregon's Center for the Oregon Center for Public Policy, really appreciate you coming on and talking with us. Thanks so much, Michael. It was a pleasure. Great. That's the show for today. Both sides have valid points. On the pro kicker side, you've got policy enshrined in the Constitution and a strong belief that it's your money and you're totally entitled to it. On the get rid of the kicker side, it's inarguable that kicker money could certainly help fund programs aimed at our most pressing social issues. At the end of the day, it's going to be up to you, the voters of Oregon, and how you view the kicker as to whether or not it will live on in our state forever. I want to thank my guests, Daniel Hauser of the Cascade Policy Institute and John Charles of the Oregon Center for Public Policy. This show, along with all episodes of Oregon on the Record, is available at klcc.org. I'm Michael Dunn, and this has been Oregon on the Record. Thanks so much for listening.